this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Let us know if you cast your mind back to episode 187, I discussed the war in the North African desert in 1940-41 with Robert Forsick. Well, I've got him back as his new book, Desert Armour, Tank Warfare in North Africa, Gazala to Tunisia, 1942-43, has been released. We're going to pick up where we left off and probably get to El Alamein. Robert, welcome back. I think we probably need to start with a recap of where we are at the start of 1942. The end of 1941 uh, saw the British relieve Tobruk and push the Axis forces back beyond Benghazi. Rommel has been retreating. Uh, Orkin Lech, the theatre commander, must have felt complete victory was in his reach. So why do we get a pause? This seems almost like a replay of the end of Operation Compass the previous year. It wasn't his entire decision. He was interested in continuing to pursue, but the, the British in the desert in the first two campaign seasons, 40 and 41, had the misfortune of external events shaping the campaign. In the first occasion, Wavell, when he pushed the Italians back all the way with the big victory, they're culminating in uh, the drive down to the desert, uh, the destruction of the Italian army. Greece happened, and Churchill wanted to divert large forces from North Africa to go support the Greeks. And in the case of Auchinleck in 1941, just as he gets down to El Alagila, the situation in the Far East is is blowing up. And Churchill has great concerns about Singapore and India and Burma. And he orders uh, the Mideast Command to start sending some reinforcements, both air and ground, to reinforce the British position in the Far East. And of course, Churchill being an imperialist in terms of mindset, is very mindful that he doesn't want to lose any bits of the, the empire in the Far East, whereas the situation in the desert seems resolved pretty much, 90%. So they end up dispatching two tank regiments, both go to Burma where they're completely, and, and these are two veteran ones, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was two of the veteran tank regiments that had played a big role in Crusader were sent out, I think uh, Third Hussars was one of them, they end up going to Burma. So that's my, you're down two veteran tank regiments. A number of uh, the Desert Air Force was forced to send some of its squadrons. Some of the colonial troops were sent to the Far East. So all of a sudden you're draining out the, uh, the, some of the core elements. And Archelech, even though he won Operation Crusader, his forces were reduced to a pretty low level as, as in Rommel's. And, he decided at that point to pull his primary armored division back to Egypt and the Tobruk area to rebuild. And the brand new, I think it was the second armored division just showed up part of it. Anyway, it was really only about a half a division showed up in the desert. So this rookie force, which had just come straight out from Blighty, uh, was told to, um, you know, you're going to be the point guys right up at front. You're going to the vanguard. And uh, you're going to be watching what's left of Rommel's army. Just keep an eye on them. Make sure they don't do anything unusual. So you're basically in a surveillance reconnaissance kind of mission. What is essentially one armor brigade, very weak, under strength. They had minimal infantry support, minimal artillery support. So essentially the bulk of his veteran force had pulled back to regroup, rebuild, or transfer to the Far East, leaving brand new, untested, untried units at the front line, which was really dangling bait in front of Rommel's nose. Uh, the Germans were always very good at reconnaissance. They were quick to sense that, gee, there's not much out there. They were expecting to have the hounds, you know, right at their heels chasing them. And all of a sudden they're looking, there's nobody chasing us. At least they're fresh units uh, facing Rommel. Rommel's on the skids, isn't he? The Africa Corps at this point. Yes, but he was very, very good about, I don't want to use the word conniving, uh, although I guess I just did, but he was very good about manipulating the system to get reinforcements uh, when he needed them. So yes, he'd lost virtually all his armor in during Crusader, but he was able to get a replenishment convoy through. And of course, his supply lines were much shorter once he was pushed back, pushed back to El Aguila. So he had shorter supply lines. He was able to get Berlin 
to release some new tanks, some new fuel reserves for him. So he was able to rebuild part of a division back up to snuff. And uh, the Italians sent some more troops. So after a relatively short period, he actually had essential parity with the British covering force that was opposed to him. And the difference is Rommel still had the veteran troops. He didn't transfer anybody anywhere. So he had the advantage in terms of skill level, rough equivalents in terms of numbers, and, uh, of course, audacity. His orders were sit in place, don't do anything crazy. And that was from both Berlin and Rome. They told him, don't do anything crazy. And, of course, the first thing he did was disobey that and start pushing as he said, a reconnaissance in force, which ended up being a hasty offensive. That's Operation Theseus. Yes. Yeah, so he, he started pushing east and quickly rolled up the British covering force in a matter of about a week and was able to push them back and then very quickly get Benghazi. And the Italian theater commander, who was nominally his superior, was literally flew and, you know, out and to confront Rommel and had a screaming session with him with all the staff officers on the side pretending they couldn't hear it and rommel just pulled his um stone face up then as soon as the italian's going all right we're going to do what i want and um it doesn't matter what he said in berlin halder who was the head of the oberkommando de here he did not like rommel either and he was telling him to put brakes on him which is why he sent paulus of sixth army fame to go uh down to rommel's headquarters and talk to him and say you know you need to rein this in this is crazy you don't have the logistics to mount a big push into libya you've got about half a division but uh rommel gave paulus some bananas and uh sent him back there's a picture of paulus with this big thing of bananas going back to berlin i always thought that was sort of funny because <laughs> they throw the they throw the allies back a couple of hundred miles almost to to brook it's a long well, run well he eventually got to to brook pretty quickly by i think it was uh march or april but then it was all that's why the chapter i've got is all quiet on the gazala front because he had enough strength and momentum to get to gazala uh out the outskirts of gazala but at that point the british defense gelled and um uh, they were able to start patching together the the Gazala line, and Rommel simply did not have the strength to attack any fortified positions at that point. So you you end up with one of the few quiet periods on the desert front where for about the next three months, not much happens. Both sides are reinforcing. The British get the Grant tank, which is a you know important for them, and they get a lot more armor from the West and some initial shipments from the United States. And then the uh, the Germans, of course, were able to build up to two Panzer divisions again. So you've got kind of squaring off with the main event, the Battle of Gazala. I realized the American version of the grant was known as the Lee. <laughs> yes, they had different turrets. And there's, if you want to get into the particulars, there's some issues with the uh, the armor composition, the engine. There's a, there's a whole mess of issues. The grant Lee is interesting because the British designers actually had a huge impact on how the tank was built. They paid for the Chrysler plant. Uh, that was uh, before the United States was even in the war. Britain was was funding that because they wanted those tanks to go to the Middle East. You know, so they were funding that when the United States was not yet funding mass tank production. And a lot of the specifications for the Grant Lee came from British requirements. So they said, you know, we want this, we want this, and and of course the other bizarre thing is if you take two steps back, you realize that. The grant itself was heavily based on the French Char B tank of 1940. Just with the just as with the French tank, they had a 75 millimeter gun in the hull, and you know the French had a 47 millimeter gun on top, and, and the American tank had a 37. But it was this idea of a, a universal tank: the 75 would engage, fire high explosive rounds, and the the smaller gun would fire the armor piercing rounds. And you had a turret mounted gun for engaging tanks and a hull mounted gun for engaging infantry or bunkers or things of that sort. And, uh, is the, the French had come up with this concept in the grant, which was just a very improvised, the British, we need this. The Americans just kind of acquiescing to it. The Americans are really much more focused on building the M4, which would become the Sherman tank. That was the tank they wanted to build. But the, the grant was a, uh, expedient design to get a 75 millimeter gun tank to the desert as soon as possible because Britain, of course, would not have the Cromwell, their first 75 millimeter tank till mid to late 1943. So there was just no way for British industry to, to 
get a 75 millimeter gun on a Matilda or a Valentine or a Crusader chassis. They tried. They tried many times, and it just did not work. Well, um, I never realized with the Grant, which you point out in the book, it's really obvious when you sit and look at it. It it fired one way better than the other, did that 75 millimeter gun, just because it's in the chassis. So it can fire right, but it can't really fire left very well because it's firing across the chassis. And you think, what a big tactical problem when the opposition figure this out. <laughs> There's a blind spot. With the Grant, you have a limited degree of traverse with the hull-mounted gun, so very little. So, yes, on the on the other side, you're completely exposed with this very high side. Of course, if you're engaged on that side, you have to physically turn the tank to get this. Now, the turret-mounted gun can turn, but the 37-millimeter gun, of course, is not that effective, uh, not by that point in the war. So the Germans very quickly realized this is a great place to aim this big side door on the side. It's amazing how many of the grants, if you look at them, were hit with shots right around this side door, which if you realize you're a, cr- you're a crewman, you're trying to escape this burning tank and the enemy's firing right at the hatch. When the grant's arriving, does it give the British and allies a, a techni- technological advantage over what the Germans have at this period? Nothing stands still, does it? Everyone's developing at the same time. It's just when it all arrives. So I'll tell you what I was taught in school and what we heard in the 60s, 70s, and 80s about this. We heard, at the time, the standard historiography that was written right not long after the war by the Michael Carvers and the guys of that sort was that the Grant was a big game changer and that Rommel was stunned and his tankers were stunned by the appearance of the Grant and this gave the 8th Army a huge advantage and all this kind of stuff. That That's what we sort of heard. That was the standard take up through about the 1980s or so, at least, maybe even a little longer. Uh, and then there's still that lingering idea that the grant was a big change for the and a big plus for the Allies. It could have been, but that's not actually what happened. And as I point out, what most histories, in fact, all of them fail to mention is in the first actual encounters, you had four company size elements of, of, uh, grants engaged and every one of them was destroyed within a matter of 30 minutes. The grants suffered very heavy losses. Now it is true. They did inflict significant losses on the Germans. The Germans did not like the 75 millimeter gun and they did take losses, but the crews on the grants, some of them had only had the grants for as little as two weeks before going into action. So it was a very hasty training program. They were phasing the tanks in regiment by regiment, so a few units were able to get up to two months to train on them, but some had two weeks. Here's another thing that people forget. Up until that time period, British tank crewmen had not been trained to fire higher explosive rounds at all because they didn't have any tanks equipped with them. Yes, there were the combat support versions of the the, cru- the cruiser tanks that had mortar uh, 94 millimeter howitzer around, but there were very few of those and they were used very sparingly, usually only two per, per regiment. So most of the British tankers had never fired high explosive rounds. Most of the British tankers had never fired at targets beyond 600 meters because with a two pounder gun, typically you could engage targets at six, 700 meters or so. With the 75, all of a sudden you could reach out to a thousand or 1200 meters. So that long range, all of a sudden you're doubling your your envelope of of engagement range. And with only a week or two or three under your belt of training, you're going up against guys. The Germans had been using uh, 75 millimeter guns on the Panzer IV for a while, and they, they had some experience with longer range gunnery. So they had that, that better ability. The British 75 millimeter gun, on the grant technically was better than what the Germans had at that point. But when you factor in the training and the inexperience, uh, the Germans tended to do better. And the British tankers had not figured out the tactics on the, on the grant either. Most of the losses occurred when the British squadrons engage the Germans head on in a meeting engagement. And then they turn to fall back because they're taking some damage. And as soon as they turned, of course, the grant becomes this giant target that can't, can't traverse its turret. It can't do a parting shot, you know, firing and retreating, which of course gave a huge advantage to the German turret and tanks that, uh, so all in all, the, the appearance of the grant, it should have helped the British more and it didn't. Also at the operational level, the, the commanders, they always seem to make sure that the, at, at no point 
I can't remember the exact numbers, but you had something at Gazala, uh, something like 26 British tank units of various sizes involved, and at no point were they ever able to coordinate more than four at a time to actually attack. So they were always attacking in bits and pieces, and so they never had that mass. Now, if you'd had 200 grants go up against the Avery Corps at one time, that might have meant something. But two, three, four squadrons sent in, often uncoordinated fashion, and allowed the Germans to, you know, the Germans always think that von Klauswitz center, we're going to play that center game. We're going to go beat this guy first on the right. Then we're going to beat this guy on the left. And so they're always shifting. And that's one of the strengths of German commanders is their ability to, to always shift to where the threat is. And uh, so if you, you know, the Russians find out the way, the only way to beat the Germans at their own game is to hit them on both sides at the same time. You can't let them come at them one in one direction, one direction. And, you know, they're just going to play that game. And you're always uh, it's kind of like the British with the Zulus. You know, you let the British infantry do that front rank, kneel, rear rank fire a bit. And they get that that little dance going and they're going to win, you know, because that's their tactical, you know, a little recipe for success. And uh the German recipe for success was always able to shift their anti-tank guns and the tanks to the threatened sector. And then as soon as they've serviced that area, move to the, to the other area. Because of their good communications, they were able to always stay, able to stay one step ahead of the other side at that point of the war. Well, in some respects, you know, Rolkelec's fallen back on the, uh, on the Gazala line with his, with his idea of defensive boxes. Is this sort of a, an attempt of sort of some form of defence in depth to hold the Germans back and to hold them at an attritional battle? Because he also falls back on, do you have the jock columns supposedly sweeping around to help yes. the static boxes? So as far as the boxes, the Germans didn't like the boxes. Obviously, the boxes meant a hard fight to take this fortified area. But, of course, it completely gave the initiative to the Germans. And the British armor ends up being in the role of the entire Battle of Gazala of our mission is to rescue the boxes that are under attack. And, of course, at no point in the battle did they ever rescue a single box that was under attack. The 150th Brigade kept requesting support, and uh, they fought a most valiant fight, just as Bur Hakim, the French at Bur Hakim, fought a most valiant fight. And the Axis were able to mass and crush both boxes, and uh, it took them time. But with air support, artillery support, they surrounded them. They were able to crush both boxes. And the Cauldron Battle, which was sort of an attempt to rescue the, the 150th Brigade, of course, was a massive failure uh, on the British part. And again, it was a coordination issue. I like von Melithen, the famous German staff officer, witnessed one of the British attacks. It was a I think a battalion of uh, Valentine tanks that came in on the left flank, on the German left flank, that was heading towards the 150th box. And he said in his memoirs, this is the worst enemy attack I saw in the entire war. He said, I, he said, I couldn't even understand the purpose of this, advancing across open terrain where they we they know we know we, that they're coming. And what is the point of this? You know, so there were many, many hard lessons for the, the Eighth Army at Gazala. And if you notice... In British military historiography, Gazala is generally skipped over. It doesn't get the attention. Crusader, I'm always amazed. Crusader gets a lot of attention. Crusader is a very popular subject today. There's a lot of interest in the wargaming community, the modeling community, various other historical uh, communities, because, of course, Crusader ended up being the first major defeat for the Africa Corps. It was pretty much a one-on-one sort of head-to-head sort of thing. Both sides were relatively evenly matched, and and the Auk won, and they relieved Tobruk. So it's a kind of a happy ending story if you cut it off at that point. But Gazala is a very messy, it's one of those disaster stories that how could they lose this? I mean, at the very least, it should have ended up sort of a draw. The British have the numerical superiority as well, the British and allies. Yes. And they not only lose the boxes, they not only lose the tank battle, but they lose Tobruk at the end of the day, too. So this is one kind of three disasters rolled into one. It's like, how do you how do you lose this badly? And the short answer, as I say in the book, is they basically misuse their armor. And this was a consistent problem with this war They at this point in the war for the British, that they had a lot of untried, untested commanders who... Um, you know, between Richie and and so many of these others who uh, – Richie was a pretty good staff officer, but he was not cut of command uh, material. And, you know, the, the British Army was not the only army that had this issue. Every army had the problem that 
all of a sudden they had to go from small pre-war regulars to a big army. And all of a sudden you had to have multiple corps and division commanders and you've got to put somebody in charge. And this guy seems relatively competent. So let's give him a shot. And then, you know, and Richie was yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. You know, he seemed like, well, he can take orders and probably could give them to, but, but, uh, this is not the guy you want to lead a mobile battle against somebody like Rommel and Rommel still did a lot of dumb things himself. So when they, they taught me tactics at school, they always said, you know, one of those early things, they said, if your supply base is here and, you know, you never want to let the enemy get between you and your supply. So what does Rommel do? He goes around, runs around the end of Bur Hakim and gets the entire Africa Corps on the other side of the British mines and boxes. And all of a sudden he realizes I'm out of supply and his back is to the wall. He's in the cauldron and the British are threatening to crush him. I think if Montgomery had been there and some of the later British commanders, the Africa Corps probably wouldn't have been, would have been more or less mangled, if not destroyed in the cauldron. They should have been. Their backs to the wall, they were pretty much out of fuel and very low on ammunition, but they were given the time to recover and they eventually drilled a hole through the British minefields and got some supplies through. But that was extremely risky and stupid on Rommel's part to put his, his army in that position. That was his choice. He did it. You know, Rommel's situation was he was always one of these gambler sort of commanders who thought he could roll the dice and he was always going to get the, you know, the lucky result. And, uh, when he didn't, he was always kind of stupefied. What do you mean I didn't win, you know, or, or win easily? And uh, yeah, he wasn't the only German commander who thought that way. Guderian thought the same way, too. But they, I think a little bit of that, I hate to say it's part of that Superman ideology they had going in the 30s. But they did have this idea that we're, we're winners and we're going to win. And no matter what we do, it doesn't really matter because we're going to win because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're the Wehrmacht and all this and i think they kind of bought into their own mythology a little bit about what they could and could not do you know numbers still still matter logistics still matter so in the desert when rommel started doing these things he was never keen on logistics to him like he said it's the ball and chain of armor warfare uh which meant he didn't want to deal with it it was somebody else's problem so at gazala he ran the real risk of being defeated Totally. Yeah, I, I often think people, people, people like Rommel and Guderian. Part of the problem is, you know, the, the old whole lightning war idea works very well until there's no end, and you just run out of steam. If you have a very strict objective, you they they could do it very well. But it's when the objectives keep shifting, and you end up with min, you know diminishing returns of your forces. Well, it goes by, right back to Frederick the Great and the German wars of the 19th century. You know, Frederick like the province of Silesia, 1740, and he wanted it. And he built this really nice war machine that was good for one campaign or two. And he sees Silesia, but the darn Austrians wouldn't make peace. And they kept fighting him to get this province back, or, you know, of a seven years war and everything. So he ended up fighting nearly 20 years to keep this one province. And, you know, later on, of course, the German army was built up on the idea, you know, of Sadova against the, the Austrians in 1866 and the French, you know, with Saddam and everything. They're built for a knockout, one big punch, knock the enemy flat, you win, you negotiate, peace, it's over. And the Wehrmacht of World War II carried that tradition. And same thing with World War I with the Schlieffen plan. The idea, the whole thing will be over in 10 weeks or something like that. And we'll be in Paris and having a, a gay time in front of the, the Eiffel Tower, drinking, celebrating our victory, you know. And the, the Germans always had this idea of the quick war. Uh, it's consistent throughout their, the last three or 400 years of their military history. The British, in contrast, have always had the idea that war is a long haul game. So, you know, very rarely has Britain gone to the war with the idea of this will be over and no nothing. It's usually the idea this is going to be a coalition fight that's going to go on a while. It's going to involve all the resources, the empire, you know, and the navy and the army. And it's going to take a lot of effort. But Germany's never had that attitude of going to war. It's always it's short campaigns, win quick. But you're right. When things don't end quickly, all of a sudden they're sort of searching for a plan B that they don't it's have. It's not there. I was going to ask about jock columns because the British are very po are very uh, keen on jock columns at this period. Uh, what are they and why are they so problematic? So the jock column was the idea of a small motorized detachment from a larger force such as a brigade. And the idea is 
it, they arose in 1940 against during the Italian campaign. They were continued well into 1941 and a little bit into 42. But the idea is this detachment is you, you take off bits and pieces, a little bit of an infantry company, maybe an artillery battery, some engineers, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You put it together under, say, a major, and you send it off and you give it a specific mission. It can be a flank guard. It can be a, a vanguard force, you know, push on and see if Benghazi's occupied or something of that for find the enemy flank or, you know, there's a whole variety of missions it could have, but the jock column is primarily designed for reconnaissance and light combat. It's not designed to engage an enemy tank regiment or things of that sort. In fact, it would be lucky. The typical jock column would be lucky if it had a few two pounder guns attached. So it's uh maybe a battery of 25 pounders but it, it doesn't have a lot of fighting capability it's primarily a armed reconnaissance unit the british liked this because it was part of their leftover of colonial warfare thinking and, and particularly in places like iraq in the 1930s uh the british had experimented with armored cars against iraqi irregulars and they had done pretty well in that situation so the jock column was this idea that a small aggressively led small motorized column could push around in the desert and they worked very well against the Italians. Of course, the Italians had very few tanks, very few anti-tank guns. So the jock columns were able to run rings around the Italians and, and often achieve valuable results, capture a fuel dump, get to some key objective first. But against the Germans, they did not do well because the Germans had a lot better weaponry, better equipment. Uh, the German reconnaissance units were better armed than the British reconnaissance units. The British recon guys hated the German armored reconnaissance cars because they were larger and had 20 millimeter guns on them, which kind of ate up uh, most of the motor transport that the British jock columns relied on. So they didn't like that. The negative for the British is the jock columns tended to sap away strength from the main effort. On some of the battles in 41, in particular, Battle Axe and uh, uh, a couple of the other actions, you had a large part of the support groups, which uh, belonged to the Armored Division, the 7th Armored Division, for example, a large part of its infantry and armor would be bled off on these little jock columns doing little secondary tertiary missions instead of massed. And that's one of the principles of war. You mass all your your main power against the main objective. You don't fritter it away on little secondary tertiary objectives. That can be, you, you know, you just don't do that. It, it wastes your your strength, your combat power. So by the time of Gazala, they were still using them a little bit. But after Gazala, the British army in the desert pretty much stopped using them. They, they would occasionally still pop up from time to time. But there was this recognition that, uh, now, they did use columns, but the, at that point, they tended to be LDRG columns, long-range desert, which were a different breed. The long-range desert columns didn't include anti-tank guns and an artillery battery, and they weren't designed to fight at all. They were just pure reconnaissance. The jock columns were too big. You know, you don't send out a, a 500-man reconnaissance detachment. It's just kind of too big. It's too much, man. But the typical jock column was about 500 troops, and, and that's just too much for its it's too little to fight and too much to do a reconnaissance mission. Uh, it just can't win anything significant. And the, the LDRG guys usually would go out with maybe a 15 or 20 man column. And if they wanted to attack a German airfield, they'd go maybe with 30 or 40. But um, the idea being that um, the, the British started realizing they couldn't, they couldn't dissipate their, their combat power on these tertiary tasks. So the jock columns, were a phenomenon of 40, 41, a little bit into 42, but they did start. And Montgomery, when he came, when he showed up, he said, no more of this nonsense. Uh, you just can't do that. Mon Montgomery was very much, I know we'll talk about him in a minute, but I, Montgomery was very much of a big show man. He, he was focused on the big show. Didn't want to hear this colonial style of uh, gallivanting about the desert with little columns and some major in search of glory, you know, Popsky's private army or something. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. Robert Fawcett joins me and we're discussing the North African campaign. We get the Gazala Gallop, which is a phrase I, 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 I sort of grew up with without really knowing what it was, but which only pushes Rommel's sort of supply lines even further, which leads us to uh, the first Battle of El, El Alamein. Uh, him winning at Gazala, does that essentially shut up 
any opposition he has in in Germany to just can you pause a moment? Or he won it, Gazala. The plan was Theseus Hercules was that if he was able to take Gazala and Tobruk, he was supposed to stop at that point. This would have been agreed on by everybody, including Rommel, prior to Gazala, that uh, he was supposed to stop at that point. Hercules, which would be executed, which is the invasion of Malta. And so all the Luftwaffe support that Rommel was getting was going to shift to support the invasion. They were going to throw the German paratroopers in, some of the Italian paratroopers, and they were going to knock out Malta. And by eliminating Malta, the threat to Rommel's supply lines would be re- significantly reduced, and all of a sudden that would allow a greater surge of logistic effort into North Africa, which would then support an invasion of Egypt. So the plan was Gazala Tobruk, reduce Malta, then, if all that goes well, then you can push into Egypt. And the, the plan was basically don't push into Egypt till probably the fall of uh, after September 1942. Wait, you know, regroup at Tobruk, build up your strength, we'll take out uh, Malta, and don't forget what was going on in the Eastern Front, the main event. The assumption was that by September 1942, Case Blue was supposed to have taken the, the oil fields and um the in the uh, Caucasus and Stalingrad should have been eliminated at that point. So the idea is at that point they'll be mopping up in Russia, and then Rommel, you can have your head at that point and push into Egypt and you know Bon Voyage, and hopefully you get some success there. But that's not what happened at all. I always look at the point of view, having been a soldier, I look at the point of how would I like to have worked for this guy. So the average German soldier in the Deutsche Afrika Corps and the Italian soldiers, they've been fighting. They started the Battle of Gazala in in June, early June. And so after a month of hard fighting, very hard fighting and heavy casualties, they take Tobruk and Tobruk at this point, there were quite a bit of supplies, food and, you know, whatnot. And at this point, the average Africa Corps soldier and tagging soldier is like, it's party time. We took the main objective. We achieved the big victory. It's time to drink some wine, sit on the beach here at Tobruk, which was littered with wreckage. But, you know, it's time to take a break, a breather. And what does their commander do? I mean, the lead units, 15th and 21st Panzer Division, they were given less than 24 hours to even sleep or rest, and they were told, on the road to Egypt. They weren't even given six hours in Tobruk to rest and recover. So you're talking about guys who've been getting by on minimal sleep, minimal food, minimal water. Uh, and I'll tell you, the Africa Corps, when you read about the water they got, it was horrible. It's amazing and any of them were alive you know, the level of amoebic, amoebic dysentery in the Africa Corps was about 40% at one time. So, I mean, Rommel himself was sick, but the water quality was so poor. Uh, the uh, So the U.S. Army today has topo units, which are specialized units that we've learned about from the desert. We learned from World War II. I think the British Army has something similar. If you conduct a desert campaign, you always bring a topo unit with you which there especially is water filtration and purification. You don't conduct a desert campaign without a topo unit because otherwise it's desert. There's no water you're going to find. And if you find water sources there locally, it tends to be terrible. The 8th Army was able to get water from purification units in Egypt, but the, the Germans didn't have that. But anyway, he gets his boys on the road to, you know, the Egyptian border within less than 24 hours. They're given no break. It's partly that pursuit, though, that's keeping the British completely off balance. Oh, yeah. They did not expect it. They expected to see the same thing in 41, that the Germans might push up to Bardia or the Egyptian border, the old, what they called the wire. They figured they might push us to the wire, but that's about it. But nope, they uh, he kept the pursuit and... There was very little in the van- German vanguard. You know, you're talking really about a battalion, a mixed battalion of tanks and some motorized infantry, a little bit of artillery, but maybe two or 3,000 troops heading east right at first, and the rest are repairing damaged vehicles, taking care of wounded, you know, regrouping. Thousands of prisoners. I mean, I forget the prisoner hall in Tobruk, but I think it was 38,000, so you're rounding up a lot of POWs. Uh, the, the final days in the Battle of Gazala was one of the very few times in World War II where British troops voluntarily surrendered. I have a photo of a Grant crew surrendering. British morale for a little bit at the end cracked, which is which is pretty amazing because even in World War I, British morale came close to cracking in 1918 during the Kaiser's offensive. Close. It never quite broke. Fifth Army was in bad shape for a little while on to go. And then uh, in the desert, British Army had some hard knocks, but Gazala, the last few days after the Battle of Knightsbridge, 
there was a crack in morale and some units just started giving up and and they they weren't being ordered to give up they just gave up and uh that was due to heavy losses particularly losses of the officers you know there was mass confusion and uh not helped by the british chain of command which was giving very contradictory orders uh abandon tobruk defend tobruk go east go west do this you know well this is where Auchinleck takes direct command doesn't he for uh el alamin briefly yes yeah so richie was out at that point and um or, or staring at the wall or whatever he was doing. But uh, is, it, is it this grip that all, I'm always slightly uh, I've soft spot for Auckland. Is it his grip on the situation event, that essentially halts Rommel uh, and uh, uh, that first element? The Ox's first inclination was to abandon Tobruk and fall back to the border. Uh, he didn't want to defend. He knew that Tobruk was not in a good state of affairs. The South African garrison was composed of, the, uh, of a division that was not well-trained and well-equipped at this point. So his preference was to abandon it. Churchill said, no, you're not allowed to abandon. Churchill, of course, was not aware of the situation on the ground. So he's not aware that most of the defenses of uh, Tobruk had been stripped to build. the. Where do you think that those mines and wire came to build the boxes that came from, that came from Tobruk? So Tobruk did not have the defenses it had in 1941. They'd been stripped. You know, essentially, it was almost in a garrison mode, and uh, it, it fell very quickly. But the ox preference was fight a delaying action at the border. He got pushed back, and then he kept trying to make a stand. He kept thinking, Rommel's got to run out of supplies soon, anytime. And so he kept making stands, just did not go very well. The Germans uh, were able to keep them on the run, and... Mercer Matru, you know, it just didn't go well. The Mercer Matru, it looked like the British would be able to make a stand at that point, and it was just such a muddled affair. You know, you lost the bulk of another British division, was uh, mostly infantry, was lost there. And some very interesting friction going on between Freyberg, the New Zealand commander, and the tank commanders. That's what really began that cat fight that continued between Freyberg and the tank generals all the way through Elamine, really bad blood somebody ought to write a book just about that subject sometime i not i had i admire the heck out of bernard freyberg he was one of the great commanders i think of he was one of the great soldiers of world war one and world war ii undisputed but on the other hand he could be very pig-headed about times about some things and he never liked tanks he never liked tankers to to him they were just one of those he had a very world war one mentality about tanks they're expendable and the world war ii tank generals didn't regard their tank units as expendable you know they, they didn't want to just be expended and you know forgotten about but uh at mercy matru it ended up being a german victory uh they essentially used maneuver and bluff to get past what should have been a relatively stable british position and after mercy matru it was next stop el alamein el alamein has labeling issues because traditionally we call it three battles with First El Alamein, Alam Halfa, and then second El Alamein. So the first two, first El Alamein and Alam, uh, Alam Halfa, are essentially German attacks, and the third one, second El Alamein, is the British counteroffensive. Now, Auk is able to barely stop the German push uh, with uh, the first two battles, and it's really nip and tuck. I think it's British artillery that won the day. The Germans and Italians were pretty much out of fuel and ammo, but they were trying to bluff their way past. Unlike Gazala, the British were only able to build two boxes, two brigade-sized boxes. And the one at El Alamein was almost a division-sized box, but it was only they only had two brigades holding it. And then they had some Indian units that were showing up that they were trying to build some boxes further south of there, but they had an income, not even really a line. It was more of a sort of blob defense and of course, the Germans immediately, you know, did their try and true. Let's go around to the south, and so you end up with two kind of uh, bare knuckle brawl actions in the in the first action with uh, Ruiz at Ridge and uh, everything. The the Germans were able to destroy an Indian brigade, which is misplaced. The British commander put it in the wrong position, and the brigade was not supported by tanks or artillery effectively. The British defense at 
with South Africans at LLM Maine itself, that box did a superb action, completely successful. The British artillery saved the day. Uh, it was the first time they found that massed artillery could actually stop the African Corps. That a light bulb kind of went off in the Eighth Army's leadership's heads at that point. Like, wow, we hadn't really thought of this before that mass artillery, if we mass all our fires, we can actually stop these guys. And they did it on two or three occasions. And the, the German, even the German tanks, now normally artillery does not kill a lot of tanks, but they certainly did not like getting hit by massed artillery fire. So it generally caused their attacks to pull back. Presumably you're taking out the anti-tank guns as well, which are always cru- crucified the British tankers. Yes. I mean, the answer to the 88 was the 25 pounder. If you used it properly, you'd figure out where the 88 was. It's a big target. It's gigantic. I mean, it's as tall as a Grant tank and uh, relatively easy to spot. The history books of Tank World War II, and in my book, I tend to denigrate the 88, though, a little bit. And it's, uh, it's a good gun. It could definitely kill tanks under ideal conditions. But the, the real German trump card was the with the five centimeter, uh, the Pac-38 uh, anti-tank gun. But it was low profile. And the 50 millimeter gun, uh, of course, could penetrate any of the tanks out there within six, 700 meters. And you weren't likely to spot it. You could stick it in a little hollow and a wadi somewhere and you keep it out of sight. The same thing with the six pounder. As the Germans found out later at the action at the Snipe in 2nd L.L. Mine, the, where uh, one British battalion, the rifles there, supported by, I don't remember how many six-pounders they had, they essentially, the six-pounders were able to take out something like 37 German and Italian tanks in one action there. Germans couldn't see the six-pounders. They were too low. Those are your best tank killing systems is a low-profile weapon. The 88's great, but it's also very huge. And, you know, it's like, there it is put artillery on it. But anyway, the uh, AUK is able to, with a bit of luck, is able to stop both German drives, which are literally on their last legs of fuel and ammunition. And these guys have, the German tankers and infantry have had no real rest uh, night and day, you know, for for weeks. So it's really amazing that the uh, they were even able to reach Alamein and launch an attack. At this point, after AUK too. You know, the, the victory's there. It's uh, out with the old and in with the new. And in comes Alexander uh, and uh, Montgom- with Montgomery in charge of the 8th Army. Does Montgomery bring a big change with new ideas and a new way of fighting? Or is he more just sort of seen as a new broom and it's a new persona that goes around? Is he is he really bringing something new and tactical to, the, to, to North Africa? So Churchill shows up in the Mideast with Brooke, uh, Alan Brooke in, in tow, and they had this big powwow in, uh, I guess it was Cairo or Alexandria, I don't remember where, with the AUK and the whole staff of the, of the 8th Army. And at that point, it becomes obvious that Churchill wants to relieve AUK. And, and he has several reasons. I mean, even though AUK has just stopped the Africa Corps, also a lot of his ideas about content for the rest of the campaign don't align well with Churchill's thinking. Churchill says, look, we've stopped them. We're deep in Egypt. We're close to our supply base. We need to counterattack as soon as possible with everything that we got and throw them out of here. And the AUK is thinking more in terms of we're going to hold here and we're going to regroup during the winter and maybe we'll get to a counteroffensive some point, but not anytime soon. And there wasn't that uh, spirit of adventure that Churchill liked in commanders of somebody who's going to, you know, yes, sir, we're going to, you know, over the fix bayonets over the top. We're going to, you know, give Jerry what for, you know, there wasn't that attitude with uh, the AUK at that point. And the AUK himself was a tired, exhausted man. He'd been just through a couple bruising campaigns against the Average Corps. So, yes, it was time for a change. But, of course, Montgomery was not the go-to guy. You know, Churchill's looking around, and his gaze falls on Strafer Gott, and he says, I want him. And, in fact, Gott was appointed to be commander to replace the August commander of the 8th Army. And he was told to report back. He was part of the covering force effort. He was told to report back, fly back to Alexandria. And through one of the uh, misfortunes of war, the Luftwaffe was able to find, you know, intercept his transport plane. There are theories that the Germans knew he was on board through signals, intercepts. I don't know. I think it was just one of those things that uh, his plane was shot down and got, and his staff was actually one of the armor brigade commanders was with him, uh, was killed. So at that point, Churchill's still in the hotel in Cairo and says, hmm, all right, well, Gott is uh, not in the picture anymore. So who else do we have? 
Montgomery was a protege of Brooke. In the British Army, like anybody other, any other army, you have people who are protégés and mentors, because like in the case of Montgomery, his protégé was Horrocks, Brian Horrocks. So all these guys had guys that they were connected with, and they, you know, it was almost, um, I want to be careful here with what I say, but, uh, you know, they, there was this re, this inner web of relationships that governed who got what commands. And uh, anyway, Brooks, Brooke recommends Montgomery, and, and Churchill was not too keen. He I think he'd had a run-in with Montgomery in Southeast Command the year before when Montgomery was there, and uh, there was something about Montgomery that Churchill didn't like. Uh, it was something petty, uh, as it could be. So he was like, yeah, what do you think? But he, in this case, he deferred to Brooke. Brooke pushed it. Bush, Brooke said, Montgomery's the man. He's a professional guy. Go with him. Churchill is seated, so Montgomery was flown out to the desert. And soon afterwards, he started bringing a bunch of his guys, including Horrocks and some of the others, to start filling in. And that, at that point, there's a big changeover. Because when Montgomery arrives, he starts weeding out. And some of the weeding out was unfair. Uh, I mentioned Ramsey was one of the core commanders. Ramsey had proven himself in the desert, but he was replaced. And you had several other, uh, a lot of the armored division commanders immediately fell under suspicion of not having Lumsden and some of the others of not having really given their best or not being the best. And so after Montgomery arrives, there's a steady trickle over the next 10 weeks or so of England of people showing up to backfill. But does he arrive with new ideas? Does he have a fresh way to fight the battle? Because, well, I was saying, do you want to hear my next? My next question was going to be, if you look at El Alamein, here's what I thought about. I was thinking about El Alamein. I think I'd just been talking to Rob Lyman, who, who touched upon Montgomery. And it occurred to me, so El Alamein, it's a big bombardment, followed by a slow, in- a steady infantry advance through minefields, followed by an armoured breakout, which sounds like a late First World War battle. <laughs> Uh, the flair, the flair for manoeuvre that Rommel has isn't in the in that planning of uh, El Alamein, which has brought me back to the question: What's Monty bringing that's new, or is he bringing what's old is new? He didn't bring anything that was new, really. But Montgomery's. So, as far as I can see, Montgomery had two talents: he had a talent for training, and he had a talent for planning. Now, as you mentioned. His approach to battle was very similar to a World War One battle, very similar to the French doctrine at the beginning of World War II, what they called methodical battle, was the idea you use artillery, a big bombardment to prep the target, you send your infantry in, and once the infantry gets a breakthrough, then you send the tanks, which is, you know, very much playing 1919, Fuller, all this kind of stuff, nothing really special. Where Montgomery does start adding some value, he realized the need for specialists, and the AUK and the previous chain of command in the Middies had no time for specialists. Most of the the end, most of the specialist commanders were were told to just get a desk over there in Cairo and keep quiet. We don't need you. The AUK's planning staff was incredibly small. He he had a small coterie of uh, three or four guys, uh, three or four officers who, who were his go to for operations, intelligence, administration, and logistics. And his entire planning staff was a handful of guys, and there was no specialization. None of them had backgrounds in armor, artillery, engineering, any of these things. Montgomery brought out specialists in each area. He brought out uh, Kirsch to be the engineer commander, who was um, very, very good at kind of mind warfare. He brought out an artillery specialist to organize the British 8th Army artillery. So all of a sudden, they got the ability to do the stonk tactic, which they had been aware of for a while, but they got really good at it. The idea was mass artillery and all of a sudden the eighth army which had even though it had more guns than the the germans typically had in terms of artillery they usually weren't used very well because they were usually dispersed all over the battlefield and the idea was we are going to mass firepower which is a very world war one concept yes but the idea is we're going to mass it in the critical sector and blast through we're going to use these better engineer tactics equipment and trained personnel to clear minefields very quickly breach drills and he brought out the same thing with armor. He brought out armor specialists with the idea that each of the the uh, component elements of this combined arms team he was building, building would be much sharper than they previously had been. Auk's concept for combined arms was to basically pick up a sheaf of different knives and hold them together like this, but they weren't they weren't really 
honed to work as as one refined blade or anything. It's like, yeah, we got the got infantry, we got tanks, we got artillery, but yeah, we're just clumping them together. Montgomery's understanding. He, Montgomery was a much more professional soldier. He was thinking of the big war. Remember, his experience in World War One was France, nineteen fourteen, nineteen eighteen. The Ox experience was mostly colonial warfare. Uh, Montgomery wanted to build this very sh- well-trained. He spent a lot of time training, a lot more time. That's why when Churchill started pushing him for an af- immediate offensive, he said, no, 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 no. And he, Brooke was able to run interference for him in London that 8th Army needs at least eight weeks to retrain. We got 40,000 replacements coming in to Egypt. We can't send these fresh troops, raw troops into battle. They'll be, they'll be massacred. Uh, we need at least eight weeks to train, integrate 40,000 replacements. We got new tanks. They were getting their first new M4 Shermans from the United States, the first two, batch of 200. A lot of new equipment coming in. Montgomery's got a new team, new staff officers. He got some really good, uh, you know me, I'm prejudiced towards intelligence. You know, that, that was my thing. Uh, so he got some really good guys in his intelligence team, very professional. He was able to build an excellent staff team excellent combined arms team at the tactical level. So all these integrated very well. Montgomery, again, to reemphasize, very good at training, very good at organization, very good at planning. His primary deficiency was operations. He knew how to build his team. He did not really understand very well how to use it. And of course, like everybody else in the British Army, he had never done anything bigger than about a division size operation. And moving ahead into supercharge and, and lightfoot, uh, lightfoot then supercharge, uh, these are core size, you know, mul- multiple core size operations. So this is literally about 900% bigger than anything he'd ever done before in his life. And his main, from the point of view of my book, focus on armor, he did not understand tanks very well. Uh, he had a very limited understanding. He, as he said, he never worked with tanks before in his life. He said that in his, his memoirs. It was apparent in Lightfoot. He felt that the, the engineers, the infantry could do these penetration corridors through the minefields in one night and push all his hundreds of tanks through these little thin corridors in one night, which, of course, is just kind of ridiculous. And when the sun came up, uh, on the first day of the operation, of course, most of the British armor is still stuck in the minefields and, you know, out in the open. So that's one of the reasons I put in the book the picture of Montgomery climbing the Grant tank there, his famous Grant tank that I think he probably got on two or three times for some photo ops, you know, and everything. They always show you the famous picture of him on top with the binoculars. That's the one the Imperial War Museum likes to show you. They don't like to show you the one. I had to look look very hard to find that one of him mounting the side of his tank there, Monty on a ladder the boss needed a ladder to get on he couldn't figure out how to get on on his own and uh supercharge is a bit of a misnomer because supercharge is the name of the breakout part of the the battle yet the 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 supercharge is remarkably slow paced compared to the pace of operations that uh rommel performs in pursuit why is Monty so slow when he really has got the uh, Africa Corps on the run? There was no way for him to go fast. So Lightfoot was a double breach operation, two armored division breaches, relatively successful. It, the breach part went very well. I would say it was 75% successful on the first night with acceptable casualties. The problem is when they started, the armor was still in the breaches when they pushed through. The Germans had limited mobility because of limited fuel, but what they did, very predictable, they mush, rushed all their armor reserves and anti-tank guns to right where the British beaches, breaches were. And you end up for the next week or so with Lightfoot of both sides just fighting at the, the, the breach sites. And the British can't push out, and the Germans really are just trying to inflict casualties and stop. So with supercharge, which which is the second phase of the operation, Montgomery decided to shift his breach effort further north, and they felt that, that sector uh, it was thought to be held mostly by Italians. It wasn't completely. There actually were Germans in that sector, too. So Supercharge shifted the main effort towards Kidney Ridge, and the idea was they'd, they'd get a better breach here. Again, about 75% successful. The problem came when they ran into the German anti-tank line uh, at Tel al and uh, which was a, a disaster. 
The British armor goes racing through balaclava style. And for a few minutes or about 20 minutes, the thought, the British thought we have a breakthrough. And when I went to school, I learned at the time that supercharge achieved a clean breakthrough because that was sort of the impression at the time. It really didn't. It got stopped after about 20 minutes and they hit the German anti-tank line. They overran a little bit of it, but then the British armor was just decimated. So you end up again with another protracted fight over the breach site. The difference was this time the, the Germans had uh, outrun their, their, their fuel was pretty much exhausted thanks to the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force intercepting the, the fuel shipments. And uh, the Axis were pretty much on their last drops of fuel and very little ammunition. So at that point, Rommel or uh, Montgomery's forces won the Battle of Attrition. The Axis front started crumbling. And uh, once the retreat became obvious, Rommel decided to save what he could of the Africa Corps. And most of the Italians were left in the lurch. So like the Ariette Armored Division, the Italian Armored Division, had been fighting in the desert since the beginning. It was uh, sacrificed and left behind. And it did fight, not to the death, but it did fight all day long until it was you know, basically shot to pieces. I, I loved how... Um, Rommel left some of the Germans, uh, including the head of the Africa Corps there, uh, was be- left behind and told, you know, you, you, man, uh, Rommel did not get along with a lot of his subordinates. And he told them, you, uh, you lead the rear guard. You, you, you protect my retreat while I'm getting out of here. And, and, uh, so. So we, we, with, with the victory at El Alameda, I was saying, I know the book goes, goes on all the way to the end of the campaign, but we, 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 we're here forever because it, there, there's so much data. But I was going to ask about, I was thinking about Rommel. And I was beginning to wonder about his reputation and whether you know, it's built on World War II propaganda, which comfortably f- works for everybody. So Germany lords his victories, uh, which allows the British to justify his defeats. To justify, sorry, justify their defeats. Does his reputation hold up at all 80 years later? Well, among fans, there's no doubt, because, you know, you say the name Rommel and people think of David Mason from the Desert Fox and, you know, and... And uh, so people think David Mason is Rommel and and, um, and some of it is his alleged involvement with the anti-Hitler conspiracy, too, gives him street credibility with Western audiences today. They think he was the good German. He was, you know, no. Rommel was very much in bed with the Nazis. His main gripe with Hitler, when you want to get into the weeds of that, had nothing to do with the Holocaust or the German behavior towards conquered people or any of that. His main gripe was that Hitler did not support him and provide additional fuel and resources, which led to his defeat in North Africa. So it was very personalized. He felt that Hitler had let him down in North Africa. That was one of his main gripes. Well, that comes out to the question of how much do, was it a secondary theatre in anybody's minds? Or well, clearly to those people who were there. Of course it was a secondary theatre. But but when you're there to Rommel, it's the primary theatre because it's his. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there's an old saying in the army, you may be it may only be a squad size action, but if you get shot, it's the biggest battle of the war. But it was his theater and, you know, he uh, was having his Lawrence of Arabia moment. And, and uh, to him, this was his theater of glory. It was his chance to shine. And if he'd been on the Eastern Front, he would have just been some one of many commanders. And uh, oh, well, I was surprised to find out, you know, he, what, 16 percent of all tank production during that period went to went to North Africa, which is a lot considering how committed they are in the on the Eastern Front. Meanwhile, only about 10 percent of British production was going to North Africa. It's quite incredible, isn't it? Uh, uh, and, and in many respects, it's a pivotal place for Britain because it's the stepping stone to the Middle East. Yet if Germany lost North Africa, it's not the end of the world. It's not part of one of their larger objectives objectives like uh, Russia is, or stated objectives in 1939. It's just they're kind of by happenstance. The, main, the Africa Corps' main objective, from the point of view of both Mussolini and Hitler and their respective commands, was to keep the Allies out of Italy and Southern Europe. And they felt as long as the Axis had a foothold in North Africa, that the Southern European area was safe, that the Allies would not attempt an invasion of Sicily, Italy, or the Balkans, as long as there were German troops in North Africa. So the idea was with this minimal investment of a few divisions, it's easier to send three or four divisions to North Africa to keep the British tied up there rather than have to spread 20 or 30 divisions to defend all of Southern Europe against potential invasion sites. So, yeah. So, I mean, and of course, once North Africa was lost, all of a sudden the Axis had to worry about 
They might invade in Greece. They might invade in, in Sicily or Sardinia or southern France. You know, so all of a sudden they had to position forces to protect all of these possibilities. In terms of Rommel's reputation, even at the time, his reputation, certainly his reputation in the places that mattered, it was not good. The OK Edge guys, uh, Alder and all the rest, couldn't stand him. They saw him as a prima donna who kept asking for more resources than he deserved. I mean, I mentioned just in terms of the Panzer IV tank, right? So the Panzer IV off G model, which is the one with the 75 millimeter long gun. This was a big deal, game changer for the Germans. They got their first long 75 millimeter gun tank. Came out, you know, in 42, the average German Panzer division on the Eastern Front, which is their main effort, was lucky if they got 15 or 20 of these. And yet Rommel got 40, 20 for each of his two Panzer divisions. And there were, I think, of the German Panzer divisions on the Eastern Front, roughly 20 at the time. I think six of them received none at all. Now, is that because he's winning? He had very good contacts. He kept sending personal representatives from his staff. And you know how you always hear that there were no SS in North Africa. That's not entirely true. Rommel's aide-de-camp was an SS officer. And he was uh, he was a captain, a Hauptsturmführer. He was constantly sending him back to Berchtesgaden or wherever Hitler was at the time to provide personal reports, basically circumventing the OKH and um, the, Rome, the, the Italian high command and giving personal reports to Hitler. And it's amazing that Hitler didn't say, hey, why is a field commander sending me as his captain to give me personal reports and also make requests, which is the same re- way that, I know we don't have time for Tunisia, but the same way that they were able to get Tiger tanks and to to Tunisia, two battalions. While most people on the East Front were never never saw them until much later in the war, and uh, he was always able to get the best new equipment. He connived. He was very good pals with Goebbels, the propaganda minister. He had ins when whenever Rommel was back in Germany, he was always going to the right parties, connecting with the right uh, party officials. And he was basically cashing in those prestige coins, saying, look, if I get this equipment, I'll, I could take Egypt. And Rama was always talking big about this oil. I'll push on past Egypt. We'll get the oil. I'll be able to do it all, you know. And, and, and you know, the, as Germany's the fortune started to, to wane in World War II and 42, there was much more of this fantasy thinking that, well, for an investment of just 20 or 30, you know, of our latest tanks, we might get oil. That that sounds pretty good. And uh, this guy's promising the sun and moons, and he took Tobruk. You know, he's well. It's that kind of thing where he, he sort of sweeps backwards and forwards. And I guess he can always. Well, I didn't have enough. If I had a bit more, I would, could have just. You know, I, look how much I did with what I had, and I never quite got there. It's sort of like the gambler. It's sort of like the gambler who comes to you and says, "Look, I've had a couple good hands. Could you give me some cash, and I'll, I'll you'll you'll get half your you'll get double your investment back. Yeah, just give me uh, some money to to some capital here, and I'll I'll, I'll win it back for you and more. You know. what a fantastic analogy. You know, and uh, but he was Rommel the gambler, and uh, to his soldiers he was. Uh, I think I don't think he was his credibility was so high with his soldiers because at no point in the war do I see him really showing much concern for his men. Not like some of the German commanders. Um, the uh, to him they were they were and, and I, I hate to say this but in a way his thinking about his soldiers was sort of the way Soviet so- commanders thought about their men that their their resources to to be used keep going until they stop and then you know to keep going until they drop I should say not stop and then just get some more he did the same thing in France in 1940 which is why he got to the channel first is he kept telling his men keep go keep go go and you can tell he's Poor guys are saying it's we've been going for forty eight hours. Can we can we can we stop and rest for a minute? You know, and uh, no, you know, just the th- the thing is, he can do that because when he gets so ill, they fly him out. But the the, the troops to the ground, they literally drop. <laughs> They're going to let drop. I've seen commanders like that, and we used to hate these guys because they tell the troops you can't sleep. But there's a rule in the military that uh, most militaries that you're not allowed to sleep in a vehicle that's moving. Somebody, you know, you have the driver and an officer is supposed to be awake. If you're leading a convoy, you're supposed to be awake and alert. Rommel, of course, was always snoozing in his command vehicle. So he was getting some rest, but he wasn't allowing his troops to rest. And and so there's sort of a bit of a double standard there. And yes, he, he could go back to Germany for a quickie break if he had to, or, you know, or Rome. He went to Rome quite often. Most of the German troops in North Africa were there for the duration. 
and uh, your only ticket home was to get wounded or seriously sick. And uh, that, that is the only thing. Well, Bob, um, thank you. I enjoyed that. It is always a pleasure. Loyal listener, uh, I will put a link to Robert Forsick's new book in the show notes and on the website. It is entitled Desert Armour Tank Warfare in North Africa, Gazala to Tunisia, 1942-43. I have a couple of housekeeping notes. As some of you may know or may not, academically, for the last few years, I've been studying First World War recruitment in the British Army for my PhD. In September this year, that took me to Windsor in Canada to deliver a paper at the International Society of First World War Studies Conference. I just want to give a shout out to Windsorite and loyal listener, Riley Prescott, who I met there and had the pleasure of chatting to. I also want to say hello to patron of the podcast, Alton Stump. Now, if you're not already a patron of the show, you can sign up at patreon.com slash www2podcast. By becoming a patron, you get access to more World War II chat bits of episodes that get left on the cutting room floor and ad free listening. So you can find out more at patreon.com slash www2podcast. Next time, one way or another, we should be looking at Italy. If we're not, something's gone wrong. So until then, I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88mm gun hit our tongue, blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. Darling, that can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.